I'll be reading from John 9, 1 through 7. You can follow that on your scripture outline or in your Bible. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as, it is, as, long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. May God add his blessing to the word. When I was a kid, um, of course, I lived in the Boston area, but living in the outskirts of Boston, you didn't really go into the city very often. Uh, when we did go into the city, my mother would always warn me about the dangers of the city. When you went into the city, you would inevitably encounter street people, dirty, disheveled, often smelling of alcohol, uh, and they would be looking for a handout. And my mother taught me early on that you walk fast, that you look straight ahead, that you do not make eye contact with you, you ignore them, which was probably good advice for a little kid, but it's something that we learn very early and we take to heart. And it becomes a habit in our lives, doesn't it? That we, we ignore people when they're in need, that we try to keep moving and, and not get caught by them, not get waylaid by them. I learned early on the, the art of making people invisible, the art of ignoring people when they were in need. I want you to think about the other side of that, though. Have you ever been the one who's invisible? The one who just doesn't seem to be noticed? The one who is ignored, overlooked? They, the one who may be considered a bother. I, I think to some degree, all of us know what that's like to be ignored, overlooked. Interesting that Jesus never overlooks anybody. The people that, that are pushed to the margins of society, Jesus would often go out of his way to encounter. What does that tell us? That tells us that God sees you. He sees you right where you are. And even those people that you may tend to overlook, God sees that he doesn't miss anyone. Now, if we're going to be followers of Christ, as followers of Christ, we are to do the things that Jesus did. And it may be that what Jesus did gives us a wake-up call that tells us that maybe we need to be doing something a little different regarding those who are in need in our world. Let's find out more about that, but before we do, let's bow our heads and our hearts for a word of prayer. Lord, as we come to your word, as we come to this place even, we recognize that we can talk all we want. But it means nothing until you show up, until you fill it with life and enliven it. And so we pray that in this moment, you will enliven our hearts by your word. For we know that your word is not just print on a page or histories or rules. Your word is living and active. By it, you make yourself known to us. And so we pray that you would make yourself known to us in this time. We pray for the one who teaches, that you'd speak through him clearly 
and put him out of the way that in this time we might see Jesus and him only. For it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Verses 1 and 2 of what was read for us a moment ago, as he went along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. He, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Just stop there for a minute. He saw him. The one that people often overlooked, the one that people walked by and tried not to make eye contact with, Jesus saw him. He didn't escape his notice. He wasn't overlooked by Jesus. He wasn't ignored. He wasn't treated as a bother. Jesus saw him. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What an awful thing to be born without sight in that day and age, in any day and age. And, and obviously there must be somebody to blame for that, at least in the disciples' mind. Somebody must have done something wrong to really tick God off to have a child who was born blind. That is the mindset. Exodus 34, verse 7, we read, The Lord punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Here's the danger of taking scriptures out of context. Because God also says that he blesses those who serve him to a thousand generations. And we often miss that. And the scriptures also say that the children will not be punished for the sins of the fathers. But the rabbis took this verse and from it they derived the idea that if a person had some physical disability from birth, then it had to be because of sin. It had to be either because of the sin of the parents or because of the sin of that person when they were born or the sin of their grandparents. There had to be somebody at fault. They must have done something wrong. These must be bad people is basically what it came down to. These are the kind of people then in the mind of the rabbis that you stay away from. These people must be somehow unclean because they were steeped in sin from birth. So they're unclean and so you avoid them. That was the mindset, and, and the disciples obviously were buying into that mindset and asking, well, um, who sinned? Who sinned? And we often see that mindset still, and sometimes share it ourselves, don't we? Something bad happens. Well, you must have really done something to tick God off to, to make that happen, right? What did you do? Why do you deserve this? We see that. Am I right? Why do you deserve this? Well, you must have deserved this bad thing that happened to you. Truth of the matter is we live in a fallen world and things don't always go like they should. We live in a world that is steeped in rebellion where all have sinned, none have, none have, uh, all have fallen short of the glory of God. So, so the consequences of sin are all around us. The world is imperfect. Things fall apart. Things go bad. Bad things happen. It's just the way it is. It's not necessarily because of something particular that you did. Because God doesn't really work that way to squash us every time we do something wrong. In fact, Jesus tells us just the opposite is true. When you do stuff right. When you're following him and, and trusting in him and doing what's right and striving to, to, to please him, you're probably going to have problems. In fact, he promises you will be persecuted. He promises you will suffer if you do what's right, if you follow him. That doesn't seem to add up, does it? But it doesn't fit in with that, oh, God squashes us. God punishes us forever. In fact, Jesus says in, in Matthew 5, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you do right, bad things may happen. If you do wrong, bad things may happen. Bad things happen. It's just the way it is. Good things happen too. And it's not always because you deserve those either. But here, the, the mindset there, the, the disciples asking right in front of this man, as if he isn't there, as if he's a non-entity, rudely asking, who sinned, this man or his parents? 
You know, this, this is one of those questions like, um, uh, you know, the judge asks a person, do you still beat your wife? Um, whether it's a yes or no answer, uh, you, you're still <laughs> being set up. And this man is being set up. You know, uh, who sinned, the man or his parents? She says, wait a minute, time up. Wrong question. It's not that anybody sinned. This was the plan and purpose of God, even from his birth, that, that God would be glorified through the work of Christ. Jesus intends to heal him. He doesn't say that at this point, but he does say that God intends that this be used for his glory. Healing is a work of God. Jesus, in, in, in verse 4, tells us, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Jesus does the works of God. Obviously, what Jesus does, he's called to do by God because he's God himself. And so what he does is the work of God. And he includes us in his work. He says, as long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. How do we define day and night? When there's light, it's day. When there's not light, it's night, right? Jesus says, while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. The day is found in me and the things I do. Well, Jesus died. He rose from the dead. He ascended to the Father. Jesus is not physically here anymore. Does that mean that the light has gone out of the world? No, because Jesus has invited us to be a part of the work that he does. Jesus doesn't just say, I am the light of the world. He turns to his followers and he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine that your good deeds may glorify God in heaven. We're invited to do the work of God with him. The light of his presence is what he's talking about in verse 5. And the light of his presence is still in the world because the body of Christ, the body of Christ is still in the world. And you are the light of the world. And we are to do the work of God while it is still light. What kind of work do we do? Well, this healing is one of the works that Jesus does. Let's take a closer look at the healing itself so we can understand. Jesus, when he sees the, the, the blind man, spits on the ground, makes mud out of it, and then takes that mud and he wipes it in the eyes of the blind man. Ew. <laughs> That's gross. I mean, that's the ultimate spit bath. You know that you're, you used to run away from when your mother tried to give you that spit bath. This is the wet willy of the Bible. Gross. Why does Jesus do this? Some of the commentators say that the Lord who created human beings out of the clay of the earth now uses the clay of the earth to restore a human being to his, to his full um, condition. That's lovely. I, I like what, what another commentator says. He says, the touch of a friendly hand would be reassuring. The weight of the clay would serve as an indicator to the blind man that something had been done to him and would be an inducement to obey Jesus' command to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Yes, that would be an inducement when I hear. <laughs> and then I feel this wet mud. What am I thinking first? Go wash. <laughs> but even the going and washing is an act of faith on, the, on behalf of the, of the blind man. The pool of Siloam is not close to where they are. He has to go across town to do it. There are probably other places where he could wash. You know, show me a water fountain. I got to get this out of my eyes. But he goes and he does what Jesus says. So there is an element of faith there. But let me ask you 
some questions. What does Jesus teach this blind man before he does this thing? What does Jesus ask of this blind man? What does Jesus explain to this blind man? Uh, does he find out the blind man's credentials? Does he find out if the man is a believer? Does he have faith to be healed? None of that. There is none of that interaction. There is, there's no checking out, you want to be healed? There's, there, there's no conversation at all. Jesus, does, that's it. And then Jesus tells him to go and wash. Does Jesus even tell him he's going to be healed when he goes and washes? Jesus doesn't give him much to go on at all. There isn't a whole lot of interaction. This man did not have to do what blind Bartimaeus did. You remember the story of Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus sat by the side of the road and he heard that Jesus was coming by. And when he heard that Jesus was coming by... There's no containing him. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he won't stop screaming it. But this man, this man just sitting there, doing nothing, minding his own business. <laughs> There's no interaction here. Did this man deserve it? Did he ask for it? No, Jesus initiated this whole thing. Now, I've been reading... Uh, a devotional book is called A Guide to Prayer for Ministers and Other Servants, something my father-in-law gave me about 40 years ago. I don't usually use devotional books. I like to do my devotions just in the scriptures. But this gives me a, 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 um, a reading pattern for scriptures, and then it gives uh, some, some nice prayers, and it gives some, um, some readings for reflection. One of the readings for reflection this week, so it's funny how God kind of throws things into your path when you need them, but... This week, the reading for, for reflection caught my eye because in the reading it said, God will not give you anything unless you work with all your strength. This is an unbreakable law. Now, this is not scripture. This is a reading for reflection, okay? But it's right up there with God helps those who help themselves, which a lot of people think is in the Bible. But it was first printed in Poor Richard's Almanac by Benjamin Franklin, and he was quoting somebody else whose name escapes me. But it is not a quote from the Bible. It is not even in keeping with the Bible. If such things are an unbreakable law, Jesus is the first to break them. This man did no work. He didn't give all his strength he didn't seek any. He had a need. Jesus saw the need. He filled the need. Can't you get burned that way? I mean, you know, think about our benevolent ministry here in the church. We, people will come to the church quite often with some need. They, they come. They, they're looking for money. They're looking for relief. We vet them. We check out if the need is real. You want me to pay your electric bill? Okay, well, let me check with the electric company and see if there's a bill there. We pay the electric company. We don't pay the person and trust them to pay the electric company. We're pretty critical of people, and we have to be. You know, we've been given uh, oversight of, of an important fund, and we want to help as many people as we can. There's a limit. We've got rules of how we do that. Jesus doesn't do any of that stuff. He sees a need. He, he fills the need. Can't you get burned that way? I, I think you can get burned that way. When I was ministering in the Boston area, uh, being in the outskirts of Boston, we would run into people who basically made a living by going around the city. In the course of a year, they would go to all different churches all the way around the city and just beg. They had great stories. They, you know, people who did this stuff they, their story was smooth. I mean, that was the first sign that something was wrong because usually if people are really in trouble and in need, they're, they're halting, they're, uh, they're hesitant, they're, they're kind of scattered in their thinking as they tell you. These guys could tell you their story and it was slick and you knew, okay, this is somebody who goes around all the churches. They don't have to go to the same church twice in the course of two, three years because there's enough churches around that they can do this to. And that's how they make their living. And it, you know, that's not the kind of people we want to be helping. 
uh, and we don't know how they'll use the funds. And they always find a way to make sure that the funds don't go to somebody else to pay something. They, they want them to come to them. Can't you get burned? Yeah, you can get burned. But you know what? Jesus got burned too, didn't he? It, we've talked before about the encounter that Jesus had in, in chapter 5 of John's gospel uh, where he uh, goes and finds in Solomon's colonnade that there's a man who's been an invalid for 38 years. You remember this story? And Jesus asks him if he wants to be healed, and the man gives him excuses. Never really says he wants to be healed, but Jesus heals him anyway. And he tells him, go, pick, take up your mat and go home. And on the way home... Because he's carrying a mat on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees are such sticklers for stupid little points that they say, that's illegal. You can't carry a mat. That's work on the Sabbath. You're working on the Sabbath. And they're looking to get him for it. And instead, he throws Jesus under the bus, doesn't he? He says, the man who healed me told me to do this. Later on, Jesus finds him in the temple courts, and he says, look, you've been made well. Stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. Does the man stop sinning? Probably not in his character. Because the first thing he does right after he encounters Jesus, he goes, finds a Pharisee and says, hey, there's the guy I was telling you about. There he is. Go get him. Throws him under the bus again. Jesus got burned. Yeah, we may get burned. Jesus did get burned, but that doesn't mean that we stop serving. We stop helping others. That We stop meeting needs. You remember the parable of the sower where Jesus talks about the farmer who goes out to sow the seed and some of it falls on the pew. I want to see if anybody's paying attention here. Some of it falls on the path. Some of it falls on a rocky place. Some of it falls among the weeds and gets choked. Uh, all of that seed is just wasted seed. It doesn't go anywhere, right? It doesn't take fruit. But some of it falls on good soil, and it produces a hundredfold. Jesus is basically encouraging us, yet yeah, we need to keep sowing the seed. Even though we know that sometimes we'll get burned, even though we know that sometimes it won't produce fruit, we still sow the seed. And you know, the nice thing is that he never stops providing the seed. We'll never run out of seed because we know the one who provides it. You might get burned, but don't stop sowing the seed. This, this event that happens, this healing that happens, actually takes place in a rather private setting. This, this is not done for the crowds. This is not done to get attention. In fact, Jesus is on the lamb at this point. If you remember, we read chapter 8, and in chapter 8, he's having an encounter with those who claim to be believers, but it turns out really they're not. Um, they claim to be children of Abraham, and he says, really, they're not because they don't do the things that Abraham did. And then he gives them that zinger before Abraham was born, I am. Right? And there's no doubt in their minds that what Jesus is doing doing there is claiming that he himself is God, the great I am who existed before Abraham, who existed from eternity, who will exist through eternity. And they are so convinced of it that they pick up rocks to stone him. And the scriptures say, but he slipped away from the crowd. And we, because we've only seen those movies about Jesus that have soft music and the gentle Jesus that never moves faster than a walk, we imagine that Jesus sort of just miraculously closes their eyes and makes his exit so grandly. I, I wonder if Jesus at that point, seeing the rock start, didn't hightail it out of there didn't run. And maybe his disciples ran right after him because uh, they realized, hey, wait a minute, something's going on. We got to get out of here. And they ran for several blocks before they realized that the crowd didn't bother to follow them. And at that point, they look at each other and break out in raucous laughter. That's just my imagination. But Maybe that's how it happened. Either way, what happened is at this point is they're away from the crowd. They have left that crowd behind. And it's now, as they're on their way, you, know, you always see Jesus and you picture him in your mind. He's walking through the streets of Jerusalem and there are these crowds of people around. At this point, no crowds. All right? he's, he's gone away from the crowd. That's when he encounters this blind man. And this is just being done 
in private, but it is the work of God. The work of God is loving people where they're at. And here, it doesn't matter whether anybody around to see it, this man is important in Jesus' eyes. He, he wants to pour out the love of God onto this man. For God so loved the world. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. God saved us in love. His mercy, his grace. That's why Jesus came and Jesus is doing the work of God in loving this individual and meeting him at the point of his needs. He doesn't talk him to death. He shows him the kingdom by his actions. That is the work of God. We must impress the kingdom of God upon people in a way that they can see and experience that they might know the God of love. Let's face it. The world has shut its ears to our talk. The world knows our talk. They know the information, but information is not transformation. We can have all the right facts and never respond to them. And the world knows the information. They know the story of the gospel. I'm reading a, a fictional story right now, but it, it tells from the perspective of a homeless man um, how he views the gospel. The gospel is just that story that they've got to hear before they can get a hot meal, clean clothes, and a place to sleep. It's just something they have to go through. It's just disconnected from their lives totally. You know, a lot of the world has heard our information. We as a church have, have developed this mindset that says that we share the kingdom of God by giving them the information. And so we have reduced the information to a, a very nice presentation of the gospel. And, and we get the idea that if we just give them this information, their lives will be changed and they will come to Christ. What we've missed is that the kingdom is not about talk, but about power and the Holy Spirit. That just the information isn't enough. I, I think of the, the ministry of the Gideons who give away Bibles all over the world. And that is just what they do. They give away Bibles, but that's really not all they do. I know that they have organized times of prayer. Those Bibles are bathed in prayer because even the Gideons who are just known for giving away Bibles, they are known for that, but they are spending their time in their regular meetings and, and on even through COVID. I know they were doing uh, uh, calls where they would pray together, pray that God would use those things because they recognize that it's by the hand of God that someone's life is opened up as they're exposed to the scripture. They need that, that experience of God's, God's presence. The world has shut its ears to the information. And if we as a church are going to reach the world, we need to do what Jesus did. When Jesus went into a place, what did he do? He immediately showed them the kingdom. He immediately revealed the power of God to their lives. He healed the sick. He made the, the blind to see. He made the deaf to hear. He made the lame to walk. He healed people of all their diseases. And then when they're saying, what is this? This is awesome. How uh, We've never seen anything like this. Then Jesus would proclaim the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is like a treasure that a man found in the field when he was digging. And in his joy, he covered it up and went and sold all that he had to get hold of it. That's the kingdom that is being shown to you right now. That's the kingdom that we need to learn to invite people into as we rebuild the church, as we design whatever the church is going to be for the future. That it needs to be an outward looking church, not an inward looking church. I think about Donna, our dear sister that uh, just went home to be with the Lord. Donna, when she first came to us, came to our benevolent ministry. She had some needs and she was cared for and, and uh, her needs were taken care of. But then she was prayed for and she was invited to church. Donna had some great spiritual battles in trying to come to church. She couldn't enter the doors of the sanctuary. There was just that much of a spiritual battle that prevented her. And we prayed with her and we met with her and we encouraged her. And 
in the last few months, as she and she's been with us for a number of years, but in the last few months when she was in hospice, uh, just such such a beautiful thing to see that what she, what she was hungering for was the scriptures. What she was hungering for was that God would walk with her through that time of her, her final days. She had her Bible, but whenever you saw her, her Bible was right there beside her. Um, she also was reading a book by Bill Bright, The Journey Home, which was his um, his recalling the story or telling the story as he was also dying and knew that he was dying. And he, he talks about the journey, the journey home, the journey to be with the Lord. Um, and, and as people would come in to Donna, her doctor would ask about the books and things like that. And she would tell them what she was reading and, and invited others to, to read. It's a wonderful thing to see um, just, just the transformation in her life. And it was more than just information. God had talked, had spoken to her life. Here we see the urgency of the work that God has given us. The urgency. Donna only had a, a short time. We only have a short time on this earth. And doors are closing. Generations have been lost. As, as we as the church have, have learned to look inward, we have learned to program ourselves in such a way that it takes care of our needs. And it ministers to the members of the church. And we've forgotten that as a church, we are a mission station. We are, are, are meant to build one another up that we might impact this world for Christ. That we might reach the world with the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ came to save us from sin. That he died on a cross on our behalf. That he was raised from the dead. And that God displayed the power of the kingdom of God in him. And that we can have new life in him just as he was died and was raised from the dead. That we also can have eternal life by believing in the name of Christ. That is what we have been called to. In verse four, Jesus says, as long as it, as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. We see more and more darkness coming over our land where, where the gospel is crowded out, where, where, where it is, is shunned from the public places. We're told that in the end times that people will not put up with sound doctrine. They won't put up with the gospel. They will surround themselves with people who will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. And I'll tell you something, America is not going to be immune to that. There is a time when night is coming. But we are still in the day. We still have an opportunity. We need to recognize the urgency of the task that we have been called to. That we are called to work while we can. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me, Jesus said. You know, the, the pandemic really set the church back. We were stripped down to bare bones. We, uh, many of the ministries, many of the programs that we used to do as a church no longer function. Because we don't have the numbers, because... Uh, we were not able to bring people together because of all kinds of things. And we look at that and we, we see really a, 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 a um, kind of a multiplication of what had been happening already in the church. Over the last 20 years, the numbers of people in churches, all churches, have really declined. And then in the pandemic, they tanked. But good things came out of that. And I think good things are still coming out of that because we recognize the urgency of the task that we have been given. We, we have recognized the, the foundational things that we cannot live without, that we cannot do without. And we've been given an opportunity at a do-over, a restart. That as we build the church again, the leadership of the church has said, well, we're not going to just do things because we did them before. We're not going to bring around programs or things that we did that we were struggling to make happen because they were losing ground anyway. We're not going to just rebuild the church where we're focusing on ourselves 
We're going to rebuild and listen to the voice of God and what he wants for his church. And it's a slow process. And it's, it's taken some faith, but we see step by step. You know, what we talked about, one piece of the jigsaw puzzle that comes together at, at, at a time. And God is rebuilding his church. And, and one of the beauties is that in the midst of pandemic, people were isolated. People were separated. And there has been created a hunger. Really, it, it's hunger that's always been there, but it, it's come to the surface more that the world recognizes it's hungry for something more. In the midst of the pandemic, when, when things went south, when, when many of the ungodly things that our, our, our country's culture has been moving toward have come to light, people are saying, this is not right. This, this is not good. We need something different. We need something solid. And people are getting hungry. Uh, according to a Barna uh, recent poll, the millennials who have been... Um, famous for avoiding anything church. There's suddenly been a resurgence in interest and in them seeking churches. There's a hunger out there. Those ages 29 to 40, the, uh, the millennials now uh, are, are turning around, even looking for something that is countercultural in the church. In 1999, only 21% of millennials had any interest in church. Now that's 39%. Not where it needs to be, but that's a significant increase. That tells us that there's opportunity because people are hungry. And we are the beggars who found food and can tell them where to find it. The pandemic also had some good in that, that it uh, brought us into the Internet. It used to be when you invited somebody to church, you invited them to come to the physical building. And let's face it, for somebody who's never been to a church, and they may have their, in their minds some cultish idea of what happens in a church, coming to the building may be very intimidating for them. They may be concerned that they're going to find something very uncomfortable for them. But now we can invite them to church and say, hey, check it out first. Check it out online. You can do it from your own living room. You can do it on your, on your cell phone. Just check out what really happens there. I think you'll, you'll find what you're looking for. In John 4.35, Jesus said, don't you have a saying it's still four months until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Open your eyes and look to the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Really a bad translation. But even if it was a good translation, most of us wouldn't pick it up because we're not wheat farmers. The, the, the Greek is reflected better in the King James, the new King James that says, where Jesus says, the fields are white unto harvest. Anybody know what color wheat fields generally are? After they're green, when they first come up, when they're ripe, anybody know what color they are? Red, yellow, gold, golden wheat fields, right? We sing about golden wheat fields, right? And if they're a golden brown, they, they're ripe, but they still have enough moisture in them that they hold together when, a, when a, a harvesting tool is put against their stalks. When they are white, they're actually overripe. They are, they are dry. And when a harvesting tool touches the stem, it, it shakes them and shakes out some of the grain. So some of the grain is lost in the process. So Jesus isn't just saying the, the grain is ready to be to harvested. Jesus is saying it's almost too late. Some of this is going to be lost because we've missed the urgency of the task. Some of it it might shake out. It's almost too late for a harvest. If you're going to harvest, you better get to it because it's almost too late. As we rebuild our church, as we, as we 
seek what God would have us be and do, we need to keep an outward focus that every recognizing that everything we do, even as we build the body of Christ, even as we love each other, Jesus said, when you love one another, the world will know you that my, my, my disciples, there's a witness in the, everything that we do that we need to be bringing to the church, to the, to the world. The church ought to be touching the world. The church ought to be making a difference in the world. The church ought to be so central to a community that when you ask where it is, everybody can say, oh, yeah, that's the church that does this. Oh, yeah, that's that church over there. When I went to my last church, um, the church sat in the center of town. There was a parking lot in back, just a small one, and then a, a small uh, patch of grass and then there was a uh, strip mall with a grocery store. So when I first went there, uh, you know, all excited, I'm the new pastor, and I talk to the to the gal at the checkout counter, and I say, I'm the pastor of Crest, uh, the, the, the name of the church. And um, she kind of looks at me blankly and I said, do you know where that is? She said, no, I never heard of it. And I pointed out the window because you could see it from there. You know, that's how unknown it was in the community. Um, the church ought to be known in the community. The, the, the church, church ought to stand out in the community, not just because of its steeples, but because of its ministry, uh, of its impact on the world around it. David Levitt was 11 years old when he read a, an article in Parade magazine called The Power of an Idea. It talked about a, a man in Kentucky who created this network of volunteers to transport donated food to hungry people. They got the hungry food, the, the, they donated food from uh, schools that sent their leftovers because the schools were throwing out leftovers. David thought it was a great idea. He went to his principal to ask if they could do that. His principal mumbled something about, you know, well, there are laws in place and we can't just. But David was not discouraged. David went uh, and uh, uh, visited the, the school board office. And there he found the name of the superintendent and how to contact him. Their eight school board members got their addresses, got their phone numbers. He did his homework. He, he found out about other programs that were happening and how they worked. And then he also, he, he studied Florida law because he was in Florida uh, to see just how all this stuff would be impacted. And then he put together a presentation that he personally sent to each of the school, school board members and the superintendent. And then he called them all to explain his idea to them. And then when he was 12 years old, uh, on his birthday, he was uh, able to go before the school board and present his idea. And they were excited about it and they approved it unanimously. And then for five months, nothing happened. David went back to work. So found out, well, why, why is nothing happening? Turns out that in order to give donate, no, donated food away, they had to be able to get airtight containers, and the school did not have a budget for that. So David went back to work, and he went to producers and markets and was able to get donations for that stuff so that it could all work again. Within two years, there were 102 schools 105 schools giving their leftover food to be given to, to hungry people. In two years, they gave away 234,000 pounds of food. All because an 11-year-old kid had a vision. I don't know if you've noticed it, but I think you have. In the last few years here in Dover, we've seen a lot more people on street corners when you stop your car. And they're looking for money. They're looking for a handout. They're looking for help. Is it just me? Or are you seeing it too? Is there a need in our community? This afternoon, I'm going to be uh, preaching the first worship service at Harmony uh, Senior Living, the, the, the new facility that's just down the street here. Um, some of our, our local pastors, we're, we're going to start a worship service for them. Uh, they're hungry for that. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about Pearl. Pearl was a lady in my first pastorate. Um, she died at 102. I 
met her when she was 94. <laughs> she lived in assisted living. Uh, there were three levels of assisted living, you know, the totally independent, the ones that needed meals and stuff, and that's where Pearl lived, and then the ones that needed total care. Uh, Pearl was uh, in that, that center group. She was in her 90s, uh, very tiny, frail lady, uh, but she had all her faculties. She could tell you some great stories, and uh, her eyes were good. So every day, she volunteered. She would go down to the lower level. Actually, this place was built on levels like that. The lower level had the highest care. And she would go down and she would read to people. Or she would go down the hall and read to people who had vision problems every day, what she could do. I think of Marion and Dot. Marion and Dot lived in another senior um, housing development. Um, it was totally a, a in, independent housing development. They lived across the hall from each other. Marion was legally blind. Um, she had served in the church for years, was in leadership roles, was just a very godly woman. And when I'd visit her, Marion would say, you, you know, I really can't do much nowadays, but I can pray. So I pray six hours a day. Well, I thought that's a powerful, I, that's a powerful ministry. I, I thought I, I'm probably surviving in this church because this woman is praying. Across the hall from her lived Dot. Now, Dot um, was a Christian, but not a very strong Christian. But Dot could see just fine, so she would come over to Marion and read her mail to her, or read her things that she needed read to her. And Marion invited Dot to have devotions with her. And so Marion would read the devotion, and, or Dot would read the devotion to Marion, and Marion would uh, often explain it. And so they were ministering to each other. I, I share those two stories from the youngest to the oldest to say, well, if somebody that young and somebody that old recognizes that God still has something for them to do, what about the rest of us? We come up with all kinds of excuses of why we can't do things. And we forget that we have all been called, all been called to do the work of the Lord. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Before we can heal, maybe God is telling us that we're going to have to get our fingers dirty with the spit and the mud of the world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you see us. We thank you that you see all those, even those who feel invisible, even those who may be invisible to others. We thank you that you see us. We thank you that you call us, that you value each of us enough that you have a job for us, that you have a gift for us to empower us to do that job in the power of the Holy Spirit, that we're not working on our own, on our own power, but on yours, not by our own calling, but by yours, that we can truly be a part of that work, that kingdom of God that is not a matter of talk, but of power in the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for each of us that you would lay on our hearts the area of our calling and service. Give us clarity. Give us energy. Give us direction. And use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, make us a blessing to the world. Amen.